people you're welcome thank you so much for clicking my name is Bukumi BK Kran. so we're going to be checking out this video this was a conversation between a Muslim and a Christian and this Christian actually brought a particular verse from the Quran saying that why does this Quran says you can fight and not kill why he's just trying to ask that why is it that you need to fight according to the Quran since is a religion of peace then why should you fight so let's listen to abdullah e, um point of view guys so let's watch all right everybody in this audience let's 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 make sure we cover if we don't cover this and cover it thoroughly we're going to be accused of having soft pedaled the whole thing so we mm. need we need to dig into this um the most often cited set of verses in this subject that I'm sure all the Christians in the audience need to hear from you about. You started to get into the context of Surah 9. You didn't have a chance to do, do so. You had to skip over it. Surah 9, 29 and 30. Let me, let me read it unless you want to have a different translation. But fight against those who do not believe in Allah or in the last day, who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messenger have made unlawful, and who do not adopt the religion of truth, that is Islam, from those who were given the scripture. Now, I looked at the Arabic, and that's the Al Kitab. This is, this is Jews and Christians. Mm -hmm. Fight until they give the jizya willingly and feel themselves to be humbled. Now, my, the, the thing that concerns me and I need to hear from you on is the very next verse. I, underst I understand that someone can say, well, verse 29 was in a particular uh, context, a particular situation in that day that is not repeated today, et cetera, et cetera, even though, if I recall correctly, please correct me, I think Umar ibn Affan used Surah 9, 29 when he did finally expel uh, uh, Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula. I could be wrong about that, but I think he did. But here's what's concerning to me. The Jews say, and this is the very next verse, the Jews say Ezra is the son of Allah, and the Christians say the Messiah is the son of Allah. Okay. That is their statement from their mouths. They imitate the saying of those who, and the root is kafir, uh, disbelieved before them. May Allah destroy them. How are they deluded? So here's my question. I understand that, that many want to say that 929 is temporally limited to a particular period of time. How is 930 related to 929 contextually? Okay. Because it, 930 is a, a pretty strong verse, and okay. it doesn't seem to have a temporal uh, application to it. Okay. Well, it was a good question, and I wanted to get through it um, in my presentation, but time uh, cut me out. So you have to understand that up until this point in, in Islamic history, the, the Prophet Muhammad Sallam and his companions uh, they had actually been supporting the Romans against the Persian Empire, not directly supporting, but morally supporting them. So we see a verse in the Quran which mentions uh, Surah 30, one, Ayahs 1 to 5, which says the, the Romans have been defeated in the nearest land, but they, after their defeat, will overcome within three to nine years. Mm -hmm. To God belongs the command before and after, and the day the believe, that day the believers will rejoice. And that was because the, the pagan Arabs would say, we are going to beat you like the Persians, our fellow polytheistic kin, beat the monotheistic Christians. And the Muslims would be morally supporting the Christians, the, the Romans against uh, the, the, uh, the, the Persians. So you had the situation, but then when you found that a, a, a emissary of the Prophet Muhammad was executed by a Roman client, the Hassanids, and then you had concerns that the Roman army was advancing into Arabia and the Muslim army went out to meet them in Tabuk, didn't encounter them and then just retreated back because they didn't find any Roman army invading them. The, the question that was coming in the minds of Muslims were, why do Romans hate us? Or why wouldn't, why wouldn't they not like us? I mean, we were morally supporting them. What, what's going on? Why aren't they, why aren't they viewing us as uh, something benign? Why are they having this antipathy? So when you had an emissary who's executed, which you, you, you just don't do that in the ancient world or even the medieval world, you don't, or even any world, you don't execute emissaries. And this hostility, we see that the verse says, those, fight those who do not believe in God or the last day. Mm. Now, it wouldn't make sense 
if, if that was meant in, the, in the, what you might see from a non-Semitic perspective, just say, oh, well, you know, five those who don't believe in God's last day, but Christians believe in God in the last day, mm -hmm. and Jews believe in God in the last day, so that doesn't yeah. make any sense. Yeah. But whenever we've seen this discussion fight those who do not believe in God in the last, last day, it's always been if someone has demonstrated by breaking the commandments of their own religion, by being immoral, that they don't truly believe in God and the last day. And we see this from the narration of the Prophet Muhammad, was be used as a refrain, those, or an imprecation, those people don't believe in God's last day, those people who've done this, they clearly don't believe in God's last day. So this is what this, this, front, this first verse is, is, is starting and saying. Mm. But let's read beyond the next verse. I know you quote the next verse. Let's read mm. beyond this. And it says, and it continues, so okay, may God destroy them how they are deluded, it does say this, and I, again, that probably wouldn't be any, any it, well, the literal meaning is, um, may God fight them, and I suppose, as a Calvinist, you believe that all humans are in a rebellious nature against God, fighting against God, mm -hmm. and it was not meaning that humans are fighting them, it's saying God fights them, who do what we consider in Islam to be, you know, blasphemous, we'll say blasphemous uh, concepts, and the, the translation usually the Jews say was Ezra. It, I want to leave it as Uzair because it might not necessarily translate as Ezra. It could be Enoch. It could be a whole number of different um, uh, individuals. However, the very next verse it says, they have taken their scholars and monks as lords besides God mm. and also the Messiah and son of Mary. And they were not commanded except to worship one God. There is no deity except him. Exalted is he above whatever they associate with him. They want to extinguish the light of God with their mouths, but God refuses to accept, ex refuses to accept to perfect this light, his light, although the disbelievers dislike it. O oh, you who have believed, indeed many of the scholars and the monks devour the wealth of people unjustly and avert them from the way of God. Those who hoard gold and silver and spend it not in the way of God give them tidings of a painful punishment. Now, this sounds to me like Calvin's Institutes of Religion against the Catholic Church. This is, what, this is exactly what he says about the Catholic Church. They become corrupt. They hoard wealth. Mm. They avert people from, the, from righteousness. They avert people from knowing the truth. Mm. And he, he doesn't have some pleasant words to say about the, the Catholic Church. And in this particular period of time, it was the Eastern Roman Empire that was doing these very corrupt practices. And the reason, and I, to back this up, that it's not uh, general to every single Christian, I'll bring a narration by the Prophet Muhammad himself. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu commanded the Muslims uh, that when, once, when they encounter these empires and, and they encounter all these issues and, and their political diplomacy of other nations, he says, leave the Abyssinians alone as long as they leave you alone and leave the Turks alone as long as they leave you alone. The Turks are pagans. At, that, at this point in time, they were pagans. And the Abyssinians were Christians. But what we see from the, the discussion of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi about the Abyssinians were that they were a just Christian nation. And so they were not to have any, Muslims were not to have any hostility with Abyssinians because they were just. And it was affirmed so, and hence this was a prohibition by the Prophet Muhammad, of which was <laughs> adhered to for at least 1,000 years after the Prophet Muhammad. There was no wars between Muslims and Ooh. Abyssinians. That only changed because some Abyssinians converted to Islam and they wanted to have a revolution, as a long story. <laughs> but that was still an internal matter, not an external matter. So that's how, that's the context behind that. Okay, let, let, me, let me put this into a context that uh, is uncomfortable but necessary. Sure. Um, there is an online uh, magazine published by ISIS, and they utilize this text as a basis for their killing of Christians. And here's the idea, and here's, here's, here's what's uncomfortable is, uh, you say, okay, this isn't all Christians. The, the, the putting together in such a close, um, uh, intimate fashion of specific Christian statements, the Messiah is the son of Allah. So here you have the idea, all Christians believe that Jesus is the son of God. God. That's definitional yeah. of what it means to be a Christian. Mm. Uh, call disbelievers, uh, how are they deluded? I think that's the same word that's used in surahs four and five when they say three. I could be wrong about that, but I think I'm correct about that. And then when it says, uh, they have taken their scholars and monks as lords beside Allah, and also the Messiah, son of Mary, again, the idea of the exaltation of Jesus, immediately followed by, and they were not commanded except to worship one God, which in all of those texts of Surah 4 and 5, where Christianity is specifically in sight, the response to saying three is always what? There is only one God, Allah. So. Why is there such a theological element here? 
ISIS uses this as their, various, their very foundation for saying, this is why we've done what we've done to these Christian people. I know that there are texts where the, the, I know about the, the delegation from Natron. I, I get all of that. Why is, the, why is the theological beliefs of Christians intimately connected at this point mm. if, if the distinction's being made? That's what we need to understand. Okay. Well, first of all, I call this um, Godwin, Godwin's second law. The first law is that as a debate progresses, the probability of um, Nantes being used or raised will, will oh, approach one. I'd... The second clause would be ISIS when it comes to Islamic discussions, the probability approaches one as a, a, a discussion progresses. Not, not meant to be a gotcha. <laughs> I just happened to, they, they put out an article yeah. that was, it was one of the most theologically laden articles I've ever seen. And I want to know, how do you refute that argumentation? Hmm. Well, that helps us. Well, it's, okay. Well, here's the thing. I've engaged ISIS supporters on uh, Twitter a lot in, in Twitter debates and so on. And I haven't really seen them bring this up as an argument to kill Christians. What I have seen them bring up and what they usually bring up is they usually bring up a very typical um, argument which Osama bin Laden brought up, which is fight, th fight them as they fight you. Mm. Whereby he argues that because the United States bombs them, that mm -hmm. they should be allowed to return that back to the United States in kind. And because the United States bombed them without regard to civilian life, they should return that in kind. And again, that, but if they only were to continue reading, but do not transgress the limits of God. That's what the verse says. That's their argument. But ISIS's enemies currently are Kurds in North Syria, uh, other rebels who are Islamic, uh, the Iraqi forces in Iraq, Turkey. There's really no Christian states that they are conquering at the moment. So this verse doesn't really apply anyway. And even in that verse, it doesn't say kill Christians who say this, kill Christians who say uh, whether the, Jesus is God or what have you. No, it didn't say this at all. And in fact, it starts with the premise, fight those who do not believe in God on the last day um, from amongst the people of the book, which wouldn't make any sense if you want to take it absolutely literally because Christians believe in God on the last day. So it clearly means that those Christians who don't care about the limits of God and really don't care about God on the last day, don't, ones who are not in their hearts true believers in God on the last day because they commit wanton corruption and they break the laws. And this is clearly what it's referring to. And even in that circumstance, and, and even if we want to take the most aggressive interpretation of that verse that you, that you can, it's not, again, it still doesn't say kill them. It says fight them until uh, what, they pay jizya, what, they become citizens? That's, jizya is basically a citizenship tax, uh, akin to Jacques Rousseau's idea of the contract citizen. So what, fight them until they become citizens? That's not really a blank check to fight people and kill them because of their ideas. Because Christians are, were tolerated, were accepted during the time of the Prophet Muhammad and afterwards under Islamic law. There is no law, no in, in opinion that says that Christians have to be killed because they say that Jesus is God. The, the phrase, may Allah destroy them after calling them disbelievers who confess that uh, Jesus, the Messiah, is the Son of God. But not um, humans destroy them. Okay, so and that is, may, and th there, is a, there is a difference, and it is only... It's a theological concept. It's a, the it's, it's a theological, it's, called, it's clearly a theological concept, because whenever we say, uh, may God fight or may God destroy, it, will, it can only be God destroys with his punishment in the hereafter, or God may ordain a punishment of his own choosing in this life, but he brings about it for his own means whether floods, earthquakes, or what have you. Is there any conceivable context in which Surah 9, 29, and 30, and 31, I guess, the whole section, is there any conceivable context in which that could be made applicable in a modern situation, in your opinion? Well, the thing is that, again, uh, there is no idea in this verse that Christians should be killed because they, they pr pr you know, pronounce these beliefs or they have a particular concept or idea. It doesn't say that at all. Um, in fact, I've often gone on record as touting with pride the uh, Islamic history's uh, long precedent of tolerance to Christians, precedent of tolerance to Jews, because uh, we could coexist. It was about not forcing people to become Muslim, but rather uh, presenting them with a choice, presenting them with the message. And that was the whole point of Islam. It's to present the whole world with a choice to become Muslim or not, to embrace Islam, to see guidance, or choose to turn away from guidance. That's, that's why God gave us free will, and it's why God gave us 
uh, why God didn't make every, the whole world in one religion, as the other verse in the Quran say. One minute. So what I would say is that um, I, I have never actually encountered an ISIS argument where they've cited that verse as a justification for killing Christians. The only argument they've ever brought is that they say the Quran allows them to copy United States of America. That's what they argue generally. And, and this argument that's un-Islamic goes against all classical scholarship because you can't target civilians in warfare. There is not even any difference of opinion on this matter about targeting civilians. With any of, of 1,400 of, of Islamic scholarship, ISIS are very much, unfortunately, a very nasty modern phenomena and not a phenomena of Islamic scholarship or texts. Thank you. All right, guys. Oh, I really love this conversation. This is more of a conversation than a debate because this is a very, you know, reasonable conversation in which both parties were ready to listen to each other and learn from each other. And I learned a lot from this, letting us understand what the Quran says about the, the particular verse that people were thinking fight and all kill, you know. And he also spoke about the Catholic, spoke about Christianity, he spoke about the doctrine of Islam, letting us understand how the doctrine works in Islam, you know, compared to Christianity and giving us a broad understanding on what the Quran says about the, the, this particular verse that says, I think he even spoke about Quran 920 and also Quran 929. And letting us understand that the Quran is trying to tell us that this is what you should do. It's God that's fighting for us. Allah is not trying to tell Muslims to actually fight like the way people see it in the, in the scripture, in the Quran. But it's God that is going to fight the battle. That was a beautiful conversation. Let me know your point of view, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.